Hello, welcome to Orchard Online. We are so glad you're here to join us. My name is Pastor Ryan Leland, and today's passage that we will be reading from is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Welcome. Our scripture reading is from Matthew's Gospel. I invite you to turn to it. Chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Hear the words of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this word given by Jesus. And we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Tuesday, October 31st, was the 506th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, many people celebrate Halloween on that day, and, and there's some of us who remember that day as the day in which the light of the gospel was made more and more clear throughout the world in the missionary movements and the humanitarian movements, and particularly the Word of God being translated into the common language of the people so that they can experience and know God personally and understand what Jesus Christ had done for them. And so Martin Luther on that day uh, distributed his 95 theses, which were uh, remonstrances. They were um, arguments against some of the doctrines of the Roman church that he felt were incorrect, such as purgatory or the sale of indulgences, the different abuses that he saw. And there's debate as to whether or not he nailed those theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg. However, they were widely published, they were unleashed, and the gospel was made known to many millions more people, and it's made its way overseas into the United States. Now, the Reformation made it to England shortly thereafter. In the mid-1500s, evangelicals, though they were many, they were being persecuted by Queen Mary. She was often called Bloody Mary because of the way she had treated many of the, the, the Protestants within England. And uh, one of the more famous English evangelicals was Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was famous for this quote that he gave when he was being burned at the stake for his faith and for preaching about Jesus and scripture. He was being burned at the stake in Oxford Square right next to Nicholas Ridley. And as they were lighting the flame, he turned to Nicholas Ridley and he says, be of good cheer, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust, shall never be put out. That was the famous words of Hugh Latimer, perhaps even the last words. And sure enough, England continued in the Reformation, ultimately leading to the great confessional documents and the transport of the gospel over to the Americas and so forth. 
Now, Latimer was also famous for saying these words, the last sermon ever delivered to King Edward VI in 1550. Here's what he said. Here's what the sermon said. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Take heed and beware of covetousness. And what if I should say nothing else these three or four hours? They actually preach for three or four hours. But these words, take heed and beware of covetousness. These words are meaningful and needed in the time of the English Reformation. He felt it necessary to preach to King Edward at that time and to repeat those words Beware of covetousness and how much more now in the United States, in the era of prosperity that we live in, in the era of achieving and trying to obtain wealth upon wealth and upon this seemingly overly inflated environment of dollars pouring through and people gaining assets and gaining, acquiring possessions and keeping up with each other that we need to hear the words, do not covet. Now, we are now in week eight of the study in which the entire church has been going through, which is the rooted network, the rooted book, the rooted small group material. And we are talking about how does God view money? Why money as a topic? It's interesting, right? That, that out of 10 chapters that the rooted book would focus on and talks about service, it talks about the gospel, it talks about Jesus, it talks about humanity, it talks about sin, it talks about how do we view God, that it would actually call out money. Here's what it says on page 150. It says, when it comes to where we put money in our lives, we often think we can keep a good balance. But sometimes when we lean toward money, we begin to serve power prestige, pride, and selfishness, none of which are from God. We want to think money doesn't have power over us or that it has a neutral place in our lives. But there are times when we listen to the promises money makes, promises to make us somebody or give us security and safety. Money is immensely powerful and the love of it makes us more susceptible to believing Satan's lies. The tricky thing is, money is part of the world. That's page 158 of the book. Now, the truth is, money is amoral. It's neither bad nor good. Many people say, oh, it's, they misquote the passage that Paul says. They said, uh, money is the root of all evil. No, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's really how money is viewed by us. It's how it's cherished by us. It's how it's used by us that can make it if towards good or towards evil. And so Jesus himself is concerned about how we view money. How do you view money? Is it a crutch? Is it something you want more of? Is it something that will gain you reputation or power? Or do you see it as a resource that can be of great use for God. I want to begin with the middle section of the passage we read just now. The passage in Matthew chapter 6, verses 21 through 23, right in the middle of this passage where Jesus talks about money, he starts referring to, he starts talking about the eyes. The eyes. He says, the eyes are the lamp of the body. It seems like a weird thing to be talking about in the midst of all this. He all of a sudden starts saying, uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Seems odd that he brings this up in the midst of talking about treasures and worry and sustenance and, and serving money. Well, Surely, we can go into a whole discussion about optics. <laughs> and yes, from an optics point of view, the eye is the lamp of the body. When you see and you have good vision, light enters into your body. When you have bad vision, light it struggles to get into your body. 2020 vision, you can see things clearly. You have clear and clarity. 
But if you have nearsightedness, you have trouble seeing. If you are colorblind, you may have trouble seeing colors of my shirt, for instance. There is limitations. And if the eye is completely unclear, if it's covered, if it's, if it's blind, then there is obstructed vision, there is darkness. The ancients would be quick to say that the eye is the window to the soul. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. The word for healthy, when it says the eye is healthy, the healthy eye, actually can be translated and has been translated in other places in the Bible, particularly James, as generous. If your eye is generous, your whole body will be full of light. Well, generous, generosity is an indicator that you are full of light. Generosity is an indicator that you are in the light. Generosity is an indicator that you follow Christ. And so, a generous person is one who would see money differently than a person who's not generous. A generous person would see money as a, as a way to expand relationships, to help others, to give away, and to be happy in doing so. And, and, and the generous person would prosper and refresh others. Generosity is being full of light. The word for unhealthy that Jesus uses here, that's translated unhealthy, is poneros. That's the Greek word which means evil or bad. So an evil eye, if your eye is evil, an evil eye often in the Old Testament refers to stingy people or, 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 or people who are cheap. In the Proverbs, these are the individuals who have you over for dinner and they're counting how much it costs for that each bite you, that you take. They're watching how much you're eating. You know, they're keeping record of it. You know, they're, they're pretending to be generous, but they're really not. They're watching closely. The stingy person hastens after riches and does not know the poverty that will overtake him. This is the person with the evil eye. And so then Jesus is pretty much saying, yeah, in the context of treasure, in the context of money, it's really how we view it that makes us walk in the light or walk in the darkness. Tim Keller, uh, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, speaks about this time in which he was going to give a lecture series. I think it was at his church. But he's going to give a lecture series on the seven deadly sins. And you know what these are. You've seen a movie about it at one point. It's, you know, there's, there's lust and there's, there's gluttony and there's sloth and and pride and wrath or anger right and and so he's going to give a, a lecture on these and he was talking to his wife kathy and she says you know what i bet you i bet you the one that's on greed is going to be the one that's least attended and he writes sure enough she was right it was the least attended see greed is a greed's a tricky thing it's easy for people to see like where they are sinning in such a way that they're lusting or that they are angry. And, but greed is not something we can easily identify. And that's why Jesus speaks about it so much in, in the Gospels. The Gospel of Luke is replete with all sorts of talk, talks that Jesus gives about the use and abuse of money. How hard is it for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's harder than a camel that would go through the eye of a needle, to which his disciples would say, how can anyone be saved? Well, with God, all things are possible. It's the gospel. It's the gospel revelation of who Jesus is and his own generosity that changes our hearts. And ultimately, a chapter later, after the, this statement Jesus makes, he runs into this tax collector, this miser, this um, extortioner named Zacchaeus who then ultimately gives away his wealth and Jesus says salvation has come to this house because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. But it's very easy for us to get caught up and to forget and to ultimately to be caught off guard and so that's why I say in this sermon topic I say in the phrase watch your eyes because we can be so easily tricked. Oh, surely we would not ever identify ourselves as greedy. Do you ever meet anyone that actually says, yeah, I'm greedy? 
Hardly ever. It's very easy to see greed in others or to point it out. Well, how hard is it to see it in ourselves? And we would turn to Jesus and say, Surely, surely not I, Lord, but are we? It's all around us. How easy is us to want more, to long for more, to try to accumulate more, to worry about it, to hold on to it, to cling to it. And, and, and as we cling to it, we lose sight of our trust in God. We lose sight of how Jesus has set us free. We're commanded in Scripture to keep your life free from the love of money and to be content with what you have. That's Hebrews 13. Or godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. That's Paul writing to Timothy. The truth of the matter is, when we have a clear view of the gospel and how Jesus traded away the riches of heaven so that he would become poor and so that he would walk among us so that we ultimately would be changed, that we would be redeemed from darkness and brought into light, then we would see that he is our ultimate treasure, not the things of this earth. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Oh, the riches, the riches are that we have relationship with Christ. Paul prays for the Ephesian church. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his inheritance and his holy people. So when we offer ourselves, we offer ourselves to God, we realize that we need to let go of the earthly treasure. So watch our eyes. The generous eye and the heart of a Christ follower is one in which we have joy in investing in heavenly treasure. Jesus begins this passage in verse 19. He says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying this. He commands us not to store up heavenly, uh, sorry, store up earthly treasures. They're a bad investment. What constitutes a bad investment? A bad investment is one that loses value. A bad investment is one that, that is not something that lasts. A bad investment is something that breaks. A bad investment is something that you can lose. A bad investment is something that could be consumed. And that's what, that's what happened to the ancients. They liked to wear fine clothing. The problem was whenever they stored it away, it would be consumed by moths. They didn't have mothballs and Maybe it was a good thing because mothballs smell terrible. But then, you know, okay, they have extra food, so they store it away in a certain place. They didn't have protected cupboards like we do now in the interiors of our house. They would store it away in barns or silos. They put it away in different places. And what would happen is mice and rats would go in there, and they would not only eat the food, but they would defecate on it, and they would destroy it and make it gross. And then, of course... People could break in through the mud walls and break into the, you know, people who store their coins and treasures on, underneath their floor. They dig a hole and they can easily dig a hole to steal. These things were easy to get at. The ancients couldn't protect it. And, and so they, it wasn't worthwhile at all to store up these earthen treasures. And how true is that for us today? I think of in the 1990s as I was coming of age, the big thing was to have an automobile that had a fancy stereo system, a pioneer stereo system with a subwoofer and speakers that were built in, your aftermarket stereo system. That was the big thing with a five-disc CD changer. And you had to be careful where you parked. People would rip it off. They actually sold these plastic devices that you can put onto the CD player that made it look like it was already stolen. But what do you do? You put a blanket over your CDs. You put a blanket over the speakers or whatever. That's what my friends did. And now, no one steals stereos anymore. 
They're worthless. No one steals CDs anymore. I still have a Case Logic CD cover thing. It has all my CDs. I like it. I still play them. There's only one car that has this CD player. No one wants it anymore. It's worthless. And you know how things, these earthen treasures, they pass away. They become a poor investment. They're worthless at the point of death. You leave the earth, what happens? It doesn't go with you. You're, it's left to your inheritors. It's swallowed up by creditors. It's taxed by your government. It's fought over by your descendants. Things fall apart. If you're a homeowner, you know exactly what I mean. These earthen treasures, it's just constant maintenance. The more treasure that you have, the more problems that you have. You know, things break. The leaky pipe. The, 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 you know, the, the door jam in your children's bedroom is not working too well. The brick front step, needs, front step needs to be repointed. The back deck needs new wood planks. And it goes on and on and on. It never ends. These things can't be your treasure, says Jesus. Don't waste. Don't waste it. Don't, don't, blow, don't blow it on that. How foolish would it be to make that your investment? When you're a Christ follower, your eyes are set on heaven. When you're a Christ follower, it is let your goods go. The pagans, the materialists, the earthly secularists, let them run after these things. They're the ones who accumulate. They're the ones who worry. They're the ones who, who seek to use this as a safety net. They stockpile. Now, granted, there's some wisdom in saving for a rainy day. There's some wisdom in having an emergency fund. There's some wisdom in storing up away. There's wisdom in that. The ant does that is in the book of Proverbs. And yet at the same time, don't put your hope in it. And don't seek full satisfaction because you won't be satisfied. Not so with us. We don't, we're not the ones who are going to put our faith in those things. Jesus says, no. Have the enjoyment of putting your investment into heavenly treasure. Heavenly treasure. Says Jesus, this is not where, where vermin and where moths destroy. They can't destroy heavenly treasure. They don't, they're not stolen. It's a long-term eternal investment. And it's one in which there is great joy of investing. The eternal rewards, says Jesus. When I come, I will give rewards to those who are my disciples. If anyone gives even a cold cup of water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you that person will certainly not lose their reward. There is heavenly rewards that are, that's in following Jesus. The Apostle Paul says that he considers everything rubbish, everything loss, compared to knowing Jesus. That was his reward. That is our reward. Relationship with Christ. That's where heavenly treasure begins. But then it continues. It goes into how can we partner in the gospel and realize that God has given us earthly wealth to make friends and to make um, disciples that we can contribute to that which is long-lasting, and that is the work of God. The parable that exists in Luke 16 of the, the manager, the, 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 the wise manager, the, 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 he, he was very tactful in how he used earth and treasure to gain friends, and Jesus commends that person because of that. That's what we are to do, is to use earth and treasure and money than to, to turn it around and invest in heavenly treasure. It doesn't just have to be about money, though. Yes, this is a talk about money. How does God view money? Some of us don't have a lot of money to kick around and to donate. Well, what about your time? What about your, your energy? What about your ideas and your gifts? What about conversation and listening? These are the ways you can make investments in heavenly treasure. That souls would be won that people would be comforted, that God's children <laughs> all the more would come to know the truth of Jesus. The Rooted Book does a d decent job defining what poverty is. Poverty is more than just not having money. It's, poverty is the result of relationships that don't work. 
relationships that are not just, uh, that are not for life, and that are not harmonious or enjoyable. Poverty is the absence of shalom or peace in all its meanings. And so, as followers of Christ who seek to make an investment in heavenly treasure, we seek out relationship with God and with people and to not cling to our wallets and cling to what is in our wallets. The mystery of all this is this, that the generous person, generous people often are the happiest. Scripture tells us this and that there's a cheerful spirit. Studies have shown that generous people tend to be the happiest. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's an act of mercy on Jesus' part that he would actually say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's actually a great diagnostic for us to determine whether or not we are truly placing our faith in him. Where your treasure is, there your heart would be also. Well, take a look at your checkbook. Take a look at your balance sheet. What do you think about when you're in private, when there's nothing else to do? Where are, your, where is your, where are you consuming? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Are you invested in the kingdom? Or are you invested in yourself? Are you invested in others? Or are you invested in your own self-aggrandizement? So Jesus says, have the joy of investing in heavenly treasure. So watch your eyes. Have the joy of investing in heavenly treasure. What's the other thing he tells us? He says, well, you've got to serve someone. You've got to serve someone. No one can serve two masters, says Jesus. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Donald Hagner, the commentator, says, if you serve, if you have two masters, you do justice to neither. Says no one, a better way to translate this actually is because people get caught up on the word hate and so forth, but, um, and that's the way it's translated here. Uh, it's got the same theme of like how Jesus says that uh, if anyone loves their father and mother more than me, he is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's the same idea of loving more or loving less. And so uh, a good way for us to, to retranslate this passage is to say, no one can serve two masters. Either you will love one less and love the other, or you will pay attention to the one and disregard the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Or wealth. So what do you serve as your master? Which one do you love more? Which one do you put on top? Is it wealth and resources? Or is it God? As it relates to money, it's a resource that God has given to you. Is it being used for God's purposes? Or are you a slave for it? Slave to it? You see, money is to be serving you by supplying your food and drink and, you know, clothing and serving God. It's not to be the other way around for us to serve money. That's how often what happens and what befalls people is that they end up serving money because they, their eyes are constantly looking to get more. And they put off, they... they, they they do not delay gratification and they end up going into debt and becoming slaves in that way to money. But ultimately we should ask, are we a slave to money or is money under our control and service to God? Are we being stewards of the resources or are we being slaves to them? This is one of the points of the Rooted Network reading that. Ultimately, you're either an owner, you consider yourself an owner, or you consider yourself a manager. The generous person sees him or herself as a manager, distributing money because it is ultimately God's. But who do you serve? Ultimately, that's the question Jesus asks. Do you have a generous eye? Do you have a stingy eye? 
Are you longing to store up earthen treasures? Or are you repurposing that which God has given you to be for God and Him alone? Bob Dylan had a song that hit the charts in 1980. And it says, you've got to serve someone. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You may be a state trooper. You might be a young Turk. You may be ahead of some big TV network. You may be rich or poor. You may be blind or lame. You may be living in another country under another name. You may be living in another country under another name, yes, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, you are. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You may be a construction worker working on a home, might be living in a mansion, you might live in a dome, you might own guns, you might even own tanks. You may be someone's landlord, you might even own banks. You might, you might like to wear cotton, you might like to wear silk. You might like to drink whiskey, you might like to drink milk. You might like to eat caviar, you might like to eat bread. Maybe sleeping on the floor, maybe sleeping in a king-size bed. You're still going to have to serve somebody. Yes, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So what is it, folks? Is it money or is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Here, here's, here, here's, uh, here's what Jesus says. He says, The Son of Man came to serve and not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for the many. And he paid a price for your freedom. He served you so that you may ultimately serve Him, not anything else. And in serving Him, you have freedom and you've been ransomed. Don't be chained by money. Flee from covetousness. Beware of covetousness. Seek God and His kingdom first. Let us pray. So, Lord, today, hear us now. We commit ourselves to hearing your voice and to understand and to bring you into our transactions, our savings, our distribution of money and wealth, our interest payments, our mortgages, our car payments, our charitable giving, our donations of time, talent, and treasure, our commitment to others in relationship. We bring you into all this and to shape us and to give us the eye that is generous, we ask. Give us the eye that would say, we want to store up treasures in heaven and to serve Jesus with what you have bestowed upon us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Loved ones, be at peace now. Thank you for joining us this week. God bless you.